Okay, six thirty. Let's call the large CUI meeting to order. Uh, welcome to our members, staff, and guests you might have. And with that, I'll ask Mark to conduct the interview. So, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Terry. Uh, one thing I, I want to say is the meeting is being recorded, so we always want to say that out loud. Thank you, Stephanie, for doing that. And I'm going to go ahead and let's. I'll start. Why don't we start introductions over here so we can have our newest member at the end? So you go ahead. I'm Joe Kadika. And I'm Mark Joggers, the Chief of Staff. Terry Song, the Business Representative. I am Diane Kennedy Schwartz. I'm the Chief Executive Officer. Welcome. Stu Peterson, Business. I am Nisha George, at or at large district rep. I wish I could take this to do. I don't learn that by heart. Mike McKillop, District 3. Alan Jesse, Ag Rep 2. Mark Barra, Builder, Developer Rep. Andy Haugen, District 4. George Marsh, Ag Rep 1. I'm Sherilyn Lombos, I'm City Manager in Tualatin, and I'm a City Representative. I'm Gwen P. I'm the Environment Rep, and uh, one of the Environment Reps, and I'm the Executive Director of Tualatin. No, Hayes even know his person. That's right. <laughs> I want to go online. I want to go online now for other uh, commission members. So, uh, Matt, can you introduce yourself? I'm Matt Wellner, one of the two builder developer reps. Okay. And Alex. Alex Fan, District One rep. Okay, now I want to introduce staff and presenters. So, Bethany, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Bethany Lynn. I'm the Habitat Program Coordinator at Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'm Stephanie Morrison with Clean Water Services. Our staff in the back room. Yes, do you want to start with you, Shannon? Shannon Huggins. Shannon McDonald, Natural Systems uh, in Nassau and Natural Storage and Clean Water Services. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. Chief Joe Gall, I'm the Chief Utility Relations Officer. Rich Hunter, I'm the Division Manager in Natural Systems. Logan Owens, Operations. Thank you very much. And with that, I will back to you, Jerry. Great, thanks, Mark. Hey, everyone should receive the uh, summary of last, last month's uh, meeting minutes. The members will acknowledge that we need and accept the summary of February 8th. We have one member of the public. My name is Rachel Lincoln. Okay. Meg, are you able to introduce yourself? Don't have audio with Meg, but I see Meg Kennedy is online with us. Okay. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. Okay, our first agenda item tonight is the Fulton Soil and Water Conservation District Partnership. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rich. Meg says she's muted <clears throat> and unmute herself. So that pop up here. <laughs> this is Meg Kanegi. I don't know if you can hear me now. Um, yes, I'm interested in this. I um, have been on the board at Carolina Park Condos and worked with your organization. And uh, I'm interested in uh, all of it, <laughs> the mission and the work. So thank you. Thank you, Meg. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Rich Hunter, and I'm the Landscape Strategies Division Manager in the Natural Systems Enhancement and Stewardship. I've been with Clean Water Services for over 15 years, so I've had the immense pleasure of helping develop and you know, watching this incredible partnership with our local soil and water conservation district um, come together, come to life, um, and blossom and flourish over the last 15 years. So 
There's so much to tell you about the story. There's no way I could possibly do it all in the time we have today. So we're going to stay really high level. And if there's more questions and follow up, happy to go into more detail after the meeting or in, in subsequent sessions. Um, so prior to coming to Clean Water Services, I worked in landscape conservation, landscape ecology in multiple places in California and Australia, on the East Coast. I can tell you in all those different places, I have never seen a program like this where we've had such an um, incredible combination of local, state, federal government coming together, working together to solve a really large scale watershed health challenge, which is the lack of riparian vegetation along a lot of the streams in the Tuolumne River. Um, it's just a great example of blending existing resources into a reliable and efficient mechanism for delivering a change on the ground that is just really mind blowing to scale um, the way that it reaches across the watershed. So, I'm very excited to tell you about the program and to have Bethany here. Very grateful for her time um, and sharing the program today. So well, we're going to go into the history. This story started over 20 years ago. Uh, we'll talk about regulatory drivers and the approach to how we are solving them and working with them. Um, and then Bethany is going to talk about the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District background, program vision, go into details on the stream enhancement program, which is how we're delivering this um, enhancement work. Some other SWCD programs that complement the work that we're doing. And then look a little bit to the past and then look ahead to the future. Okay, so like I said, this story started over 20 years ago um, with a, a bundle of watershed health challenges. Um, so in the map there, you're seeing in that green color is Washington County boundary. Then you can see the watershed for Tualatin River watershed is. Um, depicted by the shaded relief map there. You can see the main stem of the Tualatin, the, you know, the long 80 plus mile river that we have, Peg Lake and Barney Reservoir. You can see the urban service district and think about the areas outside of there, North Plains, Banks, um, and the, all the agricultural lands that are there. It's over 20,000 acres of high value agricultural farming lands. Then you have all the um, mountainous area in the coast range that's forest, right? Industrial forest. So from a watershed health, keeping the water quality in the river clean, we need to be looking across that whole spectrum of land uses. Um, we had challenges like the agricultural water quality management program. Um, Senate Bill 1010 passed in 1993 and farmers were, were struggling with how to meet these new regulations for water quality, which included riparian vegetation components on their streams. We have endangered species. Winter steelhead was listed in 1999, um, and we had critical habitat designated in the Tualatin River watershed. We had total maximum daily loads, which is a Clean Water Act term for how we control the amount of pollution that goes into the river. We had those for phosphorus, with us for temperature and other things. Um, the temperature was really the driver for this one. We also had land use regulations, state planning goal five, title 13 from Metro, which dealt with how to conserve natural resources and development and land use process. So lots of different regulatory challenges, watershed health challenges. Um, so the board gave Clean Water Services some direction to be a regional convener, to work in this space with all the different stakeholders and interests. Um, and the, the criteria for those programs that would be implemented outside the urban area are there incentive based and non regulatory, right? Not forcing people, but encouraging people to do the right thing. And then involving partners, recognizing that Clean Water Services as an urban service district might not be the best suited to work. In all those different land uses. 
So as a result of that direction, we participated in a group called the Stream Protection Opportunities Technical Advisory Committee, or affectionately known as SPOTAC. Um, and you see a picture of them there. They met, so you can see the dates almost 20 years ago. Uh, right in this right in this time frame, we've got the anniversary going on here tonight, I guess. Um, and this was a really broad participation group. The USDA Department of Agricultural Farm Service Agency, Natural Resource Conservation Service, Oregon Department of Forestry, Oregon Water Trust, Washington Soil and Water Conservation District, Metro, Oregon Department of Ag, Clean Water Services, Three Rivers Land Conservancy, Northwest Power Planning Council, OSU Extension Service, other and other groups, Small Woodlands Association. I also believe there were people in from environmental groups. I don't know if Twala River Keepers was there at the time. Um, so that would be interesting. You could ask um, some of the past stuff and see, dig into that history a bit. Um, but this group met through that time and they developed and evaluated over a dozen different options for how to work together to solve some of these big challenges. Some of these ideas ended up in our permit. And I think you've heard about watershed-based national pollution discharge elimination system permit, which is a Clean Water Act permit that allows us to operate and discharge from our water resource recovery facilities into the Tuolumne River. Um, and it also covers our stormwater program. So this permit was first of its kind nationally. And one of the reasons it was first of its kind is because of this thermal load management or the water quality trading program that allowed clean water services to offset the amount of temperature or thermal load you were uh, discharging to the river through water quality credit trading. And we did, we did that in multiple ways. We did that first by reducing the load to the maximum extent possible at the plants, and then offsetting the remaining loads from the facilities through two mechanisms, one through flow enhancement and the releases of stored water from Hag Lake and Barnum Reservoir to actually cool the water in the Tualatin River, um, and then also through the riparian planting program. And that was both urban and rural. So the riparian planting program brings up this term called shade credit. And that credit is the offset amount of thermal energy off by the trees next to the stream, keeps the thermal energy from warming the water. Um, so that shade credit total amount offsets a significant amount of our flow of our um, total thermal energy. It represents about 40% of the thermal offset that we need um, to offset the, 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 the treatment plants impact. And that um, credit is calculated using a model called the shade elite. And you can see that in the map, the green segments and the red segments, each one of those segments has a calculated value of what are the trees in that area going to, how much will they shade the water? And there's a bunch of other factors, the amount of water, the, the width of the water, the how deep the channel is, pretty complicated um, uh, geometric model. And that model gives us a value of kilocalories, a measure of energy that is the units of which we trade off the amount of thermal energy put in from the treatment plants. Um, there's a baseline, and that's what the colors represent. Baseline is the existing conditions. So if there's already canopy there, we're not getting credit for those trees, only the ones that we're planting in there. There's a trading ratio, which is two to one. So the total offset of energy we get 50% of that as credit. And that trading ratio is there for a number of reasons, but mostly it's there to deal with uncertainty in the modeling and also for the temporal impact because we get the credits when we plant the trees 
and they, they're not shaving the river for 20 or more years after that. So that two to one accounts for that um, temporal loss. There's monitoring verification requirements. Um, and there's reporting that's both monthly for the summer months of most impact or temperature on the river and then annually as well. And then the partnership part really broadens the benefit because by working with the Soil and Water Conservation District, we're able to bring in other water quality programs like irrigation efficiency, um, water rights leasing, invasive species management, improved soil health, I mean, enhanced wildlife and pollinators. Bethany will be talking more about those. A couple of slides. <clears throat> so, Clean Water Services took a very unique <clears throat> approach to how we implemented our water quality trading. Water quality trading is pretty uncommon throughout the United States. There's only a few other communities that use this approach and temperature is really regional to the northwest because of the some odd species that depend on the cooler water for rearing. Um, and the unique approach we took was this community-based approach. We could have just gone out ourselves and bought access to the south side of the river and put up a bunch of cottonwood trees and said, okay, we got our shade. But instead we said we reached out, we said, how can we most benefit the community and work with all these other interests with watershed health um, at the same time. And through that, you know, the Tree for All program, we put over 15 million native plants into the ground throughout the watershed together by working with all these different agencies um, that help us through providing access to land. Um, they provide financial resources directly into the program. They make complementary investments and they help provide effective customer service, that good government working together so that the public is receiving a more consistent and holistic message about how to best care for the watershed. Here's a map again of the watershed. I mean, you can see the orange is the shade planting project. Since 2004, about 90 stream miles have been enrolled in the thermal management. Uh, this represents over 182 separate projects and like you saw in the last slide, dozens of agencies and hundreds of individuals and then thousands of volunteers that helped come in and do some other plantings. Um, so you can visually see the urban areas in the light or the darker gray in the middle. Um, and just note the distribution of the orange, how important those uh, Rural agricultural projects are, um, they represent over half of the total portfolio. So it's a critical component for the riparian planting program. And incidentally, many of these sites are much higher value in terms of fish habitat being closer to that spawning and rearing habitat that's a limiting factor for their survival. But one other thing to note here is the scale of the program. And the connectivity we've been able to get. Connectivity is really important. Science has shown that for water quality and for habitat, bigger is better, more connected is better, um, because you extend that benefit of the shade for a longer stretch of the stream. Um, and it keeps the, the temperatures from warming up in between having those gaps. All right, and now I'd like to introduce Bethany. Um, Bethany is a Portland native, um, and she uses her love for plant biology to lead the habitat restoration program. Uh, she employs data and technology to conserve natural resources and important habitats within the Tualatin River watershed. She works really closely with the landowners and community groups, and she enjoys being that bridge of, you know, using the data and bringing it to people in the community. Um, she has biology degrees from Oregon State University and Arizona State, um, and she's been around the country as an AmeriCorps volunteer. Um, before joining Tualatin SWCD, she monitored and controlled harmful weeds in Clark County as an invasive species program coordinator. 
Um, and if she's not road tripping with her dog and burger, she's likely caring for houseplants and her veggie garden. So Bethany, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Um, so the Twalton SWCD is a local unit of government. Um, we help the community improve conditions of all of our natural resources. So we work with Washington County residents. Um, it's a voluntary basis and provide technical assistance and financial assistance. So soil and water conservation districts were originally formed after the Dust Bowl to help landowners learn how to conserve their land and protect their resources. Um, there are 45 districts in Oregon and nearly a thousand in the US. So um, there are a lot of us. Um, really work to coordinate assistance for all of your sources for all from all available sources so public and private assistance local state federal um to kind of bring that all together to develop a locally driven solution um so we work because we're part of the community um with the local board and staff So in 2016, the Tualatin SWCD received a tax base um, and we began to grow. Uh, we expanded beyond um, the stream side planting programs we had and developed new programs to address urban, rural and forest resource concerns. Um, we also created grants for the community and we have a much wider reach across the watershed now um, through a robust education and outreach program. Um, so our small group of core staff grew into over 20 dedicated people uh, with wide ranging skills. So our stream enhancement program is 1 of the oldest programs of the district. Um, our vision is really to establish native plants along streams um, to reduce runoff. Um, reduce bank erosion, provide shade. As you've heard, and to create habitat for fish and wildlife. So, the elements that make up our stream programs, um, we have financial incentives for participating in the programs. Um, we do the conservation planning and all the project management. Um, and we also connect with residents through site visits to assess the conditions of their land um, and provide recommendations um, for stream site concerns, but also um, beyond. So we have two programs that make up the stream enhancement programs. Um, so for both of them, the total cost of the project is covered for the landowner. And the projects are at least 10 years to include time for monitoring and maintenance. Um, we have ECREP, which is enhanced CREP. Some of you may have heard of CREP. Um, it was a popular federal, it is a popular federal program throughout the country. Um, and so it's been expanded with the local funds here to be so we call it enhanced CREP. Um, started in 2005 and pa pairs the funds from Clean Water Services. Pairs it with the Farm Service Agency funds, FSA, and NRCS. Um, so farmers can receive payments for participating um, to offset revenue from farm acres taken out of production. Um, and often these projects were expanding the riparian area near active farm operations. Um, the VegBuck prog program was created soon after. Um, it's evolved over the years, but it was created to be an option for those who prefer not to work with the federal government or just are ineligible for federal programs. Um, there's a, a lot of eligibility requirements um, for ECRA. So, VegBack doesn't require any certain land use, um, just a willing participant and the right habitat. Um, and it includes a stewardship agreement option, which is a type of easement. Um, and that protects the project for 10, at least 10 years, but they can opt in for up to 30 years. Next slide. Okay, so here's some data from the fiscal year 2022 um, annual report. 
So right now we're kind of at an even split between VegBack acres enrolled in VegBack and acres enrolled in ECREP. Um, enrollment varies year to year, as you can see um, on the bar chart, but our goal is to enroll 50 acres per year. Um, and we've been hitting that about. Um, and our cumulative acres here, you can see um, we're just around 1,000 acres. That includes completed projects, closed projects. That's me. I, I still didn't get those acronyms, VEGVAC and the CREP. ECREP is Enhanced CREP, which is Enhanced Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. And then VEGVAC is Vegetative Buffer Areas for Conservation. I'm still lost. I, I don't think I still understand what they mean or what it stands for. So one of them is uh, they're both operated by the Soil and Water Conservation District, and they're just enrollment options for landowners. Two different ways to get involved in the program. One of them is a federal program that we've added a local component to that increases the financial incentive for the landowner. And it also gives them other benefits like our project management and our native plant um, material availability uh, over their standard CREP. And then the, the non federal is vetch back. And that's one that we created uh, with the soil and water conservation district locally to offer landowners something different that wasn't federal requirement. Um, as Bethany was saying, some of the federal requirements have eligibility needs that not everyone can meet. And we wanted to have multiple ways for people to participate. Um, you can see it's an important component to have both because they're about equal in terms of enrollment. Did that help? I think so. Thank you. Let's go. Okay. There'll be more time at the end for QA as well. Are there, are there any fundamental differences in terms of how they are, in terms of what the results are of each of those? In terms of the outcome on the ground, I would say no, but Bethany, maybe you would like to comment on that as well. Uh, no, we, we approach the, the implementation the same. It's really just different structure of incentives and paperwork and funding sources, but on the ground, um, they're operated the same. Okay, thanks. It's, it's a difficult one to get. So uh, this slide shows the breakdown of where the funds are spent. So um, the program has different elements, but the majority of the money that goes to the program is goes to the implementation. So doing the planting, paying the contractors to, you know, spray invasives, all of those things. Um, Another large component is the landowner payments. So those are important. Those go to the people enrolled um, either on an annual basis or right when they sign up, we have different kinds of payments. Um, and so over time, we've improved our methods to be more efficient with our funds. So we do um, an early and very thorough site prep um, to ensure success once we do plant um, using bare root plants that we procured at a low cost. And then um, we do a high density planting to ensure success over time. Um, and the next slide shows uh, how it varies across the partners. So these are the partners that contribute to the funds that, that go toward all of those elements. Um, Clean Water Services has the largest contribution. Um, and one thing about this slide is the district component. It's really just uh, a snapshot of what we uh, put in in FY22, but we have obligated other funds and we have our in kind contributions. So it kind of doesn't quite capture all of that, but this is a nice visual to see how all the partners are involved. What's the landowner cost? That is so uh, an older version of the VEGVAC program 
used to have landowners pay in a little bit um, every year as kind of a way for them to um, also contribute to the project. Um, that's since been um, removed um, just to simplify and, uh, uh, you know, the programs evolve, but we still have those legacy ones that have that cost share. So I wanted to show that. I thought some of this funding comes from the putting tax I didn't quite hear that, but maybe Rich can cover that question. You want to repeat it a little? <laughs> so I think I can. I think you, the question was whether or not uh, funding for SWCDs come from a property tax. So I think that's a reference to the levy that was passed. Twenty sixteen. You know, yeah. So yes, there's a levy that was voted on in the region that provided an operating levy to the Soil Water Conservation District. That money, I don't, I don't know if they, I don't, I don't know if that funds any of these programs or not. Bethany, that would be a question that I have to leave to you. It it does the the cost the tax base um, funds our contribution. So we our major part in this stream enhancement is sort of like bringing the partners together and getting the work done on the ground. So we don't have a lot of dollars added yet, but over time we're hoping to contribute more. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Um, this is a follow up. So, when you say payments to the landowners and things, is there like a categorization or classification of what kind of landowners? Is there a minimum? Um, Do you have to landowners to whom you make the payments? We will work with any willing participant and the newer versions like the current version of the program doesn't ask for the landowner to contribute anything so we've gotten rid of that requirement so the the um, focus audience for this is the farm community so okay. agricultural lands outside of the urban areas um, many of them are in tbid Tualatin valley irrigation district served properties or ones that have water rights of their own um, and they are um, stream side areas so places near wetlands and streams um, where there's no native vegetation that's there that, uh, to shade the stream and provide that buffer for water quality so that's the focus of where we're trying to get this done um, and that 50 miles or so that the district has implemented all in those kinds of areas. Fantastic. That was Does okay. that help? Okay. Are these mostly all family farms, local family farms? Bethany, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, we work with a, a lot of small farms. Mm -hmm. Okay. The way to think about this is across the state of Oregon and really across the country, People are struggling to figure out how to have agriculture participate in the water quality improvements um, within a watershed. And what we've been able to show by doing it as an incentive based non regulatory program, you actually get people working together to protect the water quality of the river. So, folks all over the country can look at the structure that we have with all of these partners. So, and the basis of it is with the farm bill. So the federal government is talking about the renewal of the farm bill and PrEP is part of that. So we've been able to enhance it to really make the water quality improvements that we need to do. So that's the way to, to think about how we've been able to link ag into the solutions or people are complaining why ag isn't part of the solution. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of fantastic. I think that's where is the biggest impact. Because last fall, I think I live on the banks of Butte and Creek, right across from Butte and Israel Highway. Last fall, CWS came and did a lot of work for soil conversation or soil erosion, things like that. I was trying to put this into place, looking at this, a multitude of these small, tiny ones, or I now understand that it's the big farm ones that are.
Maybe this will bring it down to the ground level a little bit more, okay. seeing, seeing these images. Go ahead. Yeah, so, okay, we have a, a few before and afters coming up. So this is a project along a tributary of McKay Creek that was started in 2014. So you can see um, no shade dominated by weedy pasture grasses. Um, and then right now it's a diverse wildlife habitat. Um, the monitoring results show 40% shade and 15% invasive cover now. Um, this one is in the Gales Creek Basin along Little Beaver Creek. So you can see um, not a lot of shade and some invasive species there. And then um, this 2019 photo, you can see the trees and shrubs are taking off and we're at 53% shade and 18% invasive cover. And this last one is along McKay Creek. Um, again, you can see this is um, pretty often what we see, you know, maybe one tree, but um, Otherwise, reed canary grass and other weeds. And now you can see the shrub layers taking off. There are more different species of plants. And our latest monitoring shows 72% shade and 20% cover across this whole project. So in 2019, the district created the Habitat Conservation Program, and that is using tax-based funds to allow us to restore different types of habitat. And these are shorter term projects um, and often paired with other programs. So you can see in this map um, on the left, we have um, a veg back program um, as we've talked about. And then on the, on the right, we are adding um, some prairie and upland habitat. So idea is just, you know, more is better. And this way having, we can meet community needs when we have more options and um, improve water quality across the watershed. And then the habitat conservation program that we created can also address aquatic habitat concerns, um, such as bank erosion, um, fish habitat and fish passage barriers. So we've been able to bring together partners and grants um, to have a larger impact across the basin and, and do in-stream projects that we would never be able to do by ourselves. Um, so this picture is one that, that happened last summer. And then the tax base also let us take more of a leadership role in the watershed to address invasive species. Um, we were able to kind of consolidate work in, instead of multiple efforts across different organizations, we kind of took a, a role and, and now we have a cohesive countywide program that, that multiple partners support um, to address new and existing invasives, provide technical assistance to residents um, and conduct more widespread outreach and education. So we've got a little short video here, and this is a bit of a look to the past. It has three of the early adopters of the stream enhancement program interviewed. It's something we shot in 2014, when we thought it would help really connect with those landowners and farmers and maybe give you some sense of why did they decide to do this? The farm's been in the family for, I'm the, I, I'm the third generation, my nephew would be the fourth generation, almost 100 years. And on our farm, we have about two miles of the upper tributary of the Council Creek drainage area. And we've planted all native species, trees and shrubs to help cool the water, filter the water, provide cover for wildlife, pollinators, insects, bees, birds.
I was part of the team that helped develop a thing we call ECREP, which is Enhanced Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. First year, we had one project. Next year, we had three. Third year, we had 27. The agricultural community is buying into it because of the multiple benefits we're getting. I had this land that I didn't know what else to do with, and I thought it'd be neat to put that back in this forested land. I leased them 26 acres, and to me, it's just a beautiful working relationship. Well, they're getting more different. Wildlife is coming in there because there is vegetation and trees and stuff for them to be there. We're getting cleaner water. We're getting cooler water. We're stopping erosion. We're filtering chemicals, fertilizer. We're getting better watersheds. We're getting better wildlife protection. We all recognize we have got to protect these natural resources, or we're going to lose. Water's a public asset, so as it passes through our property, we need to make sure that we protect that. Sometimes you know what is right, but it's hard economically to do it. And because of this partnership, we're able to economically also do it. Sorry for the technical challenges there. Thank you, Stephanie, for making that happen. Hopefully you got enough of the gist of that. Some really, really cool interviews, those folks. And just hearing that common value, you know, the shared values that make this partnership so special. It's not just the organizations, it's for our regulations saying, oh, we gotta go do this, of course, there's really a common, um, value for that that watershed health there that I can do. Ten years, would you do it again? Absolutely. The sentiment still the same amongst sorry? Is the sentiment still the same amongst all the landowners along the we've had very good re enrollment um, success. Bethany, I don't know if you want to comment on this. I yeah, we've had great re enrollment and um the landowners interviewed here, um, one moved out of the state, but the other two uh, did re-enroll with us and are still participating. <clears throat> yeah, and that's actually a great segue into this slide because that's one of the important factors for our future success is being able to sustain that relationship with the place, with the people out there on the ground, still make it a viable place to do business, to have a farm, do the things that make it economically viable. Um, it's really important. And that's part of why that incentive program, you heard it from Lyle there, why that incentive program is so important. It makes it possible to do the right thing. Um, so yeah, we've got a long list of things we're tracking out there. And that we're working on at different levels with this partnership and with the broader partnership of Tree for All and other other groups throughout Watershed um, and the county. Certainly, climate resilience is important. Are we putting the right trees out on the ground for the future forests? Right. And how do we make those decisions? We're, we're doing some research and development into that area right now in collaboration with the Soil and Water Conservation District, Metro, and other um, native plant groups. Wildfire is a huge issue with climate and with, with the forests, especially in that urban um, interface and where we're working around residents and farms, have structures and buildings, a really important component. Um, new chemicals and water quality and how can we use nature-based solutions more effectively to deal with some of these emerging contaminants. Um, environmental stressors, I mean, heat domes and invasive species and all, all those things are long-term factors on the, the success of these forests and you know, making sure that that shade is there for the long-term. <clears throat> Clean Water Services continues to receive credit as long as we can show that those trees are providing that shade, providing that function, that water quality value to the system. So all these are really important um, and you know we have various task forces and groups kind of working on 
how to incorporate them into future programs and how we manage them. Um, and with that, I'll leave the rest of the time for more human error. Thank you very much. I, I want to take an opportunity to um, thank you. This is a, it's a remarkable uh, effort. We have to do it in the future. It's an imperative for us for how we offset thermal impacts. The other thing I think is very important to recognize is this program really out of the advisory commission. 2001, the board of directors directed CWAC to look at partnership opportunities, including things like there's this thing called CREP. Nobody's enrolled in it. Watch the guy, I've never heard of it. Can you look into it? A couple of years later, a subcommittee of this commission was put together to really do our side of the work on there. And in, in response to the, the comment that you were making to Glenn there was John McDonald, who was in that, chaired that uh, the, the executive director of Trout Unlimited, Tom Wolf, who was on that committee, uh, a member of the Urban Streams Council, Dennis O'Connor was on that committee, Linda Craig from the Audubon Society Board of Directors was on that committee, John Cousins with uh, 12 Valley Irrigation uh, District was on that committee too. Really, that a lot of that heavy lifting was done by this commission because our board was asking you all at that time, should this be, should we be taking urban ratepayer dollars, investing them in the rural area? Is that going to give us the best bang for our buck? And boy, I mean, I know some of these people are around still, and I think just so much pride in what they've been able to put together and what Rich and his crew and Beth and the work that SWCD has done is just Thanks for the additional historical context, Mark. That's great. I saw Stu had a hand up. Yeah, do you, do you reach out to the landowners and say, if they're buying these street banks and say, hey, would you like to participate in this? Or <laughs> they come to you. Or... Bethany, you want to take that one? Um, it's, it's a mix. Um, some people do hear about us from neighbors and come see us, or we've been sending out mailers to you know, people we hope would want to participate and sometimes that works, sometimes not. Um, so it, it is a mix at, at the beginning. I think it was a lot of word of mouth and, um, you know, the early adopters, they say, and, and now it's more of a mix, but we do have an outreach program trying to target, um, properties that we think would have a large impact if we enrolled them. How much land do you need on either side of the bank or the, the creek or the tributary uh, plant? Is it like 10 feet, three acres? Uh, uh, that's a great question. And I, I, I would say that the best ecology answer there is it depends. Um, but average rule of thumb, we get the most shade benefit. So if we're focused just on temperature, from the first 50 feet of the, away from the stream. So think stream bank and then 50 feet away. And that's one of the reasons why our vegetative corridor standards have that same um, number in it for the urban area. Um, but there's a lot of other benefits, both to nutrients, sediments, as well as wildlife habitat, um, carbon, all kinds of other things from expanding that out. Um, and so some sites, it does make a lot of sense to go wider, especially where we have wider floodplains. And those are wetland and upland complexes along the stream that enhancing the hydrology of those can have a really good impact on the water quality in the river too. But that's kind of the rule of thumb. The uh, farm program prep, I think we go up to 180 feet. Bethany, I think that's right, huh? The shade yeah, leader model, cool. the maximum is 135 feet. So anything we go further than that is not part of credit for clean water services directly. Language. Yeah, I'm curious as to whether there's currently enough funding for the demand, funding for the current demand. And also, are you looking at, I mean, there's huge dollars coming through 2026 from the Inflation Production Act for uh, Watershed resilience and restoration. Is that a part of the equation or part of the, the planning in the watershed? I know that's kind of a, a big thing right now, and it, nobody's exactly sure what that looks like. So, I guess two part question. Great question. Um, yeah, we, we have um, an interest in acquiring more shade credit 
Um, so the funding we we would need for that is there. As Mark said, it's an imperative for us to continue um, to grow that program. Um, so I would say yes for that. I think there's great opportunities with federal funding programs. Um, we didn't go into a lot of detail, but Bethany and Lacey and others at the Soil and Water District have done great things with leveraging federal programs. The RCPP, which you know, Rural Conservation Partnership Program, I might be making that up. Um, yeah. It's alphabet soup. That's one that we've been able to leverage the funding Clean Water Services gives to bring, I think, about two million additional dollars into the basin. So yeah, we're definitely looking at those opportunities. I don't know, Mark. Do you have anything else? Well, well, one thing I'd say is, you know, I remember I think I know, it was the last meeting, maybe the meeting before when Tracy Rainey, uh, who was our government affairs manager, came and talked about our federal legislative agenda, and our board is very focused on conservation programs in the farm bill because of the recognition of the support that it provides staff in particular because we're leveraging those particular things. I think that's mm -hmm. this particular program is probably the one. We are certainly going after dollars that we can get the structure done. We have a number of programs there. Specific to this, it's really the farm bill which is why it's important to Maybe we can talk more about details of that at the you know, follow up. Yes. Um, I didn't understand. Uh, there was a couple of references of um, the tax base expanded your access. What does that mean? Um, so I'll start and maybe Bethany can, can finish and, and give some more specifics. So the tax base is in reference to the Wallaton Soil and Water Conservation District. Prior to that, um, they were only getting funds through uh, state, Oregon, Watershed Enhancement Board funding, and Farm Bill programs, so federal programs. They didn't have a local source. And Clean Water Services program, this riparian planting for shade credit, was a significant component of what their overall funding was. That helped them build capacity and to demonstrate that track record and build their profile in the community to then be able to lead a measure, funding measure in 2016, where voters approved a tax levy to give additional local dollars to the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District for a broader program that's much bigger than just riparian planting. Okay. Yeah. Anything to correct or amend on that, Bethany? I, I think you covered it well. Um, we, you know, because the, the entire county, you know, voted for us to get that, that is why we expanded our, our, you know, area to address all concerns in the county. Hopefully the last question. Uh, following upon the question. Do you guys have, you have any comment on how you address the existing shade area, preserving what's already there? Most of your presentation was, hey, there's nothing there, we want to go and put something in. Where does that fit into your picture? I, th I love that you asked that question because that's something I ask myself a lot. Um, it, that's one of the challenges with the model we have is the baseline is existing conditions. So the only incentive for us to invest to, to get that credit uh, return on investment is to put in in the gaps. But we know there's resource issues in the existing forest, and we need to make sure that that sustain itself and that connectivity can be there. And that's why these this collective approach and doing things with partners is so important because they can bring other resources to help fill the gaps for those kind of areas where we have forested areas that just need invasive species treatment or they might need some diverse plantings to add some additional species in there. Um, it's not just us 
doing all of that. Um, there's also many different ways that the areas are protected um, it's from like direct impacts when you're going in and logging it or cutting it down. Um, that Senate Bill 1010 and the Ag Agricultural Water Quality Management Plan, Oregon Department of Agricultural Regulations um, require that if there's native vegetation that's functional alongside streams, that they be that that be maintained. And farmers can actually be um, found in violation of that and have to work with groups like the Soil and Water Conservation District to replace it. So there's a regulatory component that helps protect the existing forest in those areas that's now in place that wasn't always there. That legislation passed in the early 90s and it has still been a uh, ramp up of implementation over time. In the urban area, we have our design and construction standards that set aside the vegetated corridor area, which is a, a buffer to the, the wetland and stream areas. So that's a way it's protected. And then there's other groups like Tualatin Conservation District, or Metro, or other parks groups or private conservation groups that will purchase property or easements to keep existing resources intact. That help. Yeah, it's, it's a patchwork approach and the, these landscape conservation strategies require that fabric of different strategies, um, different solutions to address all those different um, situations that are out there in the landscape. It's not one program can really do all those things. It's always a big picture. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sorry if I missed her earlier, but what is the capacity of the program and on an annual basis, how much of that capacity is actually being planted annually? By capacity, do you mean like how much new areas added or? Yeah, like what, how, how much productivity could the program generate on an annual basis with the funding that's available? How much of that capacity is actually being done on an annual basis? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, Laughing a little bit because Logan's been asking me the same question since he reminded me. I love that question, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> it really depends on the landowner interest. So the question I was asked about outreach and you know raising the profile and getting the word out is really the limiting factor. I guess so. To say another way, if you had all the landowner interest that you could. Have you have uh, a ton of landowners? How much annually could you pl could be ground could be shaded, could be you know planted? You got an answer for that one, Bethany? <laughs> well, our goal with the staff we have right now, so we have two project managers and a technician, and then myself, kind of overseeing the program. Um, we aim to enroll fifty acres a year, and that could be one project or it could be three projects. Um, this month, we just enrolled a project that's 26 acres um, on Christensen Creek. So that was pretty exciting. Um, so I don't think we could, without more staff, we can enroll a lot more than that in a year um, since there is a lot of process that goes along with it to make sure it's a good project. Um, but we've been able to hit it so far, so, um, I think there's still plenty of opportunities out there. And at this point, do we have a waiting list? Is there like a, a long backlog? People waiting to see if they can get in? Um, not necessarily. We do. Um, if, if people have just a small slice of stream, sometimes we'll kind of wait on those in order to gather more of their neighbors to make it a larger project. Um, so we have a few of those and then. We're planning, um, we have two or three that are, we're planning and hoping to enroll before the end of June. So there's always like a few on the way, it seems, seems to keep us busy. And then each year we have um, projects expiring that we also um, evaluate to see if they should continue or, or not. So we have those enrollments as well. I think also, if you look at, 
the need, right? Our, our imperative is we need to offset the thermal impacts. So there is a, and it's literally measured in kilocalories. There's a kilocalorie load that we have to offset. So there, and we do that through three, really two ways, releasing cold water out of Hague Lake, right? That's why we have water up there in the summer. Rich and Bethany plant like mad. And then also, you know, there's mechanical things that we do source control, we cover them, die, you know, we cover them like a fire or something in the treatment. But, and, and, and we're always getting more water, right? It's, there's, there's growth in Washington County. So we have those issues that keep producing this. And water reuse. And why, well, yeah, so what we ask is that human. Yes, water reuse is the other major imperative because then you pull that more water out of the river. And so that's, that's The other thing to keep in mind is that if they're adding the 50 acres, they've got a thousand that we're already managing out there on a hundred different farms. So and that's still an ongoing thing every year at different levels, of course. Um, but I think we're almost out of time. But I I'm just curious what happens when a project gets pulled out of the program? It seems like there's like a timeline of when something is evaluated for re enrollment. If it doesn't get re enrolled, what happens? Yeah, well, a variety of different things can happen. Um, one is the, it just stays there and it's managed just by the landowner as as a forest and it's still providing the same benefits. If we can verify that through monitoring, either by going there or by uh, remote sensing, like using aerial photos and that kind of data, um, we can still say that's shade credit. Um, Sometimes they might enroll in a different program. Um, and then other times um, the project might not be successful and we would take it out of the shady credit portfolio. That happens, not very common, but it has happened. Bethany, I don't know if you have other, if you're really in the thick of the re-enrollment conversations. So. Um, I, don't know, I mean, that covers it. We, we, we try to keep good relationships. Um, sometimes people are just, ready to end it, but they're okay with us monitoring as needed. Um, sometimes they want to move from e to veg back and do a 30 year and just have it be solid for a while. Um, and other times, yeah, it's a, it's a small project. Maybe we enrolled it right when the program started and, and now it's complete and, you know, really doesn't need to stay in. So. Can I ask a question real quick? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, it just, it's more a curiosity of anything, but of the thousand acres that we have under management, was any of that productive farmland before we restored it? Um, some of it probably was. I, I don't know how to um, figure that out, but a lot of times it's low productivity land that floods often that's hard to farm that's expensive um, maybe they'll have one good yield one year and then they get two or three years that flood them out um, so often that's when um, they start looking at other options and um, turns out that could be good habitat for us to restore so um, i wouldn't say it's all um, you know farmland but um, there is some in there I guess, is there a, a thought process that we go through if somebody brings a piece of high value farmland and for whatever reason, they don't want to farm it, but they want to put it into our program? Do, I mean, would we have a reason to reject that? And I'm only thinking of that from a kind of one of our state land use policy is relative to ag land and such. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know that we <laughs> have, have had that discussion. Um, it usually if it's high value, uh, though, our program will compete with what they could, you know, get farming it. So yeah. um, it kind of works out that way. It's it's more, it's the program's better than a low value, um, you know, difficult to farm area. I, I think it's important to remember the program focuses on that zero to 50 feet from the stream bank or the yeah. zero to 120 feet. 
It's not like you're taking farmland that's under active management to grow crops or for other purposes. You're really looking at that boundary zone between the edge of the traditional water and that section just up the bank from it, which isn't typically productive farmland. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is part two of our natural hazard mitigation plan and McDonald's, Chris Novotny. And the CWAC role on this item is providing input on the draft. I thought you guys ready for me to start. We are, we are. You are great. Hey, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Chris Novotny. I'm the strategic risk manager for the district. In this role, part of my responsibilities are to assist with the coordination of the emergency management program. As you'll recall, at the February 8th meeting, we spoke about Clean Water Services participation in a countywide effort to update FEMA's natural hazards mitigation plan. CWS's portion of the plan, known as the Annex, addresses the impacts of natural hazards on our operations and infrastructure, as well as regional water quality and detention facilities. This is the first time CWS has had a standalone Annex. In previous submittals, we were part of the Washington County Plan. So the hazards addressed in our plan include dam failure, drought, earthquake, heat, extreme heat, flood, landscape, volcanic ash, wildfire, winter storm, and windstorms. Kind of everything you'd ever want in a hazard situation and more. So tonight we're gonna to do a quick recap of our annex, discuss the general themes received through the public comment period, and outline our next steps. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Ann McDonald, the Senior Water Resource Program Manager, who's been the lead on the project for CWS, and Shannon Huggins, who's been our Public Involvement Coordinator for the project. Ann, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so as Chris said, I'm Ann McDonald, uh, Senior Water Resource Program Manager here at Clean Water Services. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be in front of CWAC uh, in person again. I mean, last month was uh, remote and we had technological glitches and I'm anticipating none of those today. So thank you very much. Um, as Chris said, uh, we talked the last time about the, the general uh, purpose of the plan, the premise of the plan, that it, as it is focused on our staff, our facilities and the provision of the services that people expect from clean water services. So um, tonight, I really want to talk a little bit, go into the the um, annex that is our kind of our piece of the plan. Um, if you recall, there's the base report that acts as an umbrella over all of these annexes, and then all of the plan partners, so the cities and the other special districts, along with Washington County and Clean Water Services, each has an annex that describes that the, um, all right, it's definitely where my, is it better to use this? Okay. Um, uh, so each annex then describes the facilities, the vulnerabilities that we see from, um, looking at the hazards relative to what we've already done and what we might have left to do at, on our facilities, and then comes up with a set of action items that we anticipate being able to need in the next one to five years um, that could help mitigate for some of those vulnerabilities. We also, um, once we got everybody, saw everybody else's cards, um, we did look for consistency uh, uh, with the other annexes, um, because we are the last out of the shoot, we can kind of fill in gaps that that uh, we see, and we'll be doing that in the next 
uh, finishing out work in the, the next week. There isn't a FEMA requirement for consistency between the annexes. These are our documents and they are to be useful to us. But what that means is that what Washington County wrote and how they describe things is different from what TVID or TVWD wrote. And it's different a little bit from what Clean Water Services has written. So our focus review, as I said, is going to be on you. I love my backup here. Um, on the CWS specific annex, I, I can answer some questions certainly on, on the base report. That has already been packaged up at, at the um, and sent on to FEMA for review. So the next time the base report and everybody else's annexes will get uh, substantially revised will be five years hence when we're doing the 2028 plan. way ahead of myself here. So I appear to be the technological glitch. Um, <laughs> the mitigation goals, I think, are, are useful to, uh, to revisit. Uh, and again, these were developed by all of the plan participants as a group. Um, this is uh, on the slide is just the very abridged version, but I, I would um, recommend that if you get a chance that you go ahead and, and take a look at the full text. I think we've we've gotten a, a good set of goals that that we can go back and uh, and work with. All right. So in terms of um, the vulnerabilities that uh, we looked at. We focused on our critical facilities, our non-critical facilities, and then our nature-based investments as, um, as sort of classes of, of vulnerabilities. And Rich just gave you an absolutely wonderful overview of a good, by far the, the largest portion of our nature-based investments. And, and they are crucial to our being able to deliver uh, the services that we need to treat water, allow people to have hot showers and warm water wash when they need it, um, and still manage the thermal load in, in the Tualatin River. Critical facilities are those specifically um, that would be attended to as quickly as is humanly possible in the event of a region-wide hazard, say a, a, a large earthquake. Um, if everything is critical, nothing is critical. So we've really focused on those larger elements of our sanitary system, our water resources recovery facilities, uh, pump stations, force mains, the siphons underneath the, the Tualatin River where um, sewage is carried under the river and um, uh, which we wouldn't want uh, to see broken. Um, the non-critical facilities then are the smaller diameter of, and some of the, the local infrastructure um, that, that Clean Water Services has, for which Clean Water Services has responsibility, um, and our uh, storm system, which well, individual, individual, say, water quality facilities might be useful in the event of a low cost emergency or even a larger, larger event. Um, we're not going to try and immediately fix the, the storm system. The action items are um, really written, trying to look at near-term activities that we might do to address some of the, the vulnerabilities that, that we found. So one of the big ones, and I anticipate that CWAC will hear more of this in the next uh, six months or so, is a watershed navigator position um, that would be housed at the, the Tualatin River Watershed Council and would be um, uh, managed in partnership with Clean Water Services and and the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. 
this is an outgrowth of an effort, a joint effort between the SWCD and Clean Water Services that started several years ago and resulted in the Watershed Navigator website, which I, I hope you take a chance to, to go check out, that has online resources for um, uh, residents here in the Tualatin Basin and really how to live near and around a stream, how to deal with water, how to um, how to live the good life in in terms of existing well with the natural environment in the, the Tualatin Basin. We're trying to augment that with a, a staff position, as I said, at the Watershed Council. And we have actually applied to FEMA for a grant to uh, provide uh, the bulk of three years worth of, of funding for that position. So that is our lead action item. That's our highest priority action item. We also, uh, um, certainly equally important, is making sure that we have an appropriate funding strategy for the Scoggins Safety of Dam projects. Um, as dams go, this is one of the most seismically vulnerable in uh, the Pacific Northwest, possibly even in the Western US. Uh, and uh, we wanna make sure that we are a robust partner for Bureau of Reclamation. And by putting it into this plan, we were telegraphing to uh, uh, the broader community that, that we have that commitment. Res improving the resilience of our infrastructure and our operations is sort of the next category of, of action items. And um, one of those, for instance, is um, support for the uh, seismic upgrades that we're anticipating at field operations. Those are already um, in our capital improvement plan. And so we're, we're demonstrating again that commitment. The nice thing about these action items is that by having them in this plan, it signals to FEMA, um, as well as uh, other funders, uh, priorities that we have. So um, uh, it's, it may be something, for instance, that, that, uh, excuse me, that we can go to FEMA for external funding, that or for, for other similar projects. So, uh, and then the last one is the general support last category of actual items is the general support for emergency management, emergency response activities that would be done cooperatively with Washington County, with the other cities, with um, uh, other special districts. So things like the Emergency Management Cooperative of Washington County, which is the website that, that um, the base plan and, and all of the other annexes, uh, along with Clean Water Services Annex, were uh, posted on during the public review process. This is the first time I've been in person on, on this machine too. Um, thank you. All right. There's always a need for a backup, um, but I think I've lost credibility with my daughter on, in terms of managing technology. Um, so in terms of, of where we go from here, the public review, uh, the public review time for period for the general public has been closed. And as I said, the base report and the other annexes have been sent on to FEMA. Um, we are, continuing to accept um, public review, certainly from, from CWAC, but we also then will be taking the CWS annex to the board for just a, a look-see at the board learning session in April, and Mark will be presenting kind of the, the overview for, for that, so that the board, already familiar with the Washington County annex and with the base plan, will see ours coming along and, and be able to put that into context. Once that's done, if there are any other revisions that the, the board requests, we can make those and then send it on to the state of Oregon Office of Emergency Management 
and send it on, and they will send it on to FEMA for review. That starts a 45 day review clock. Um, we expect uh, uh, that we shouldn't have uh, too much back and forth with FEMA to respond to any comments or, or questions that they have. And um, we'll then finalize the plan uh, and uh, in response to, to their comments as needed and take that then to the board for approval, um, anticipating June or July, depending on when we can get FEMA comments back and when we can get on the, the board's calendar. And then, as I said, we have a new, we'll have a, another plan to uh, update to do in 2028. In the interim, we will be checking in with um, Washington County and the other uh, plan participants and just tracking how well we're doing on implementing these action measure action items, seeing which ones might need to change and, um, and getting ready for the 2028 plan. So we're a snapshot in time now. Um, uh, not having an action item in this plan does not prohibit us from doing something if we see that it needs to be done. Um, but uh, it does then allow us to receive um, a lot of the pre-disaster uh, grant uh, programs that FEMA has going. And we will be tracking the activities of, uh, of Clean Water Services in Oregon, which uh, Chris uses as the, the risk management uh, tracking system. So, uh, so this is something that will live um, long after the plan is approved by FEMA. And uh, those of you who are on CWAC in five years, you'll hear about it then. So with that, um, I will take comments, questions. Yes. So I was around in 97 with at not just Lake Oswego, but Lake Wallachan. And I was wondering, is that the model that they use for flooding? I mean, is that what they look at and say, okay, what happened then? What do we that out? Um, in parts of of the um, the basin we use the 96 flood. And uh no, she had a cost. You know what you answer. So <laughs> um, uh, so, yes, um, there is a hydraulic model that FEMA has of the entire Tualatin Basin, and that's the one that they use to set the regulatory floodplain. So that's really what we used, but they, they tweak that model in some places um, to account for observations from 1996. Sure. Okay. But do, do they have a plan and do they... Use that as a plan, which is that a future plan and actually manage that. And, yeah. Not just to establish a floodplain, but to think, okay, what could we, what could happen to the land? Sure. Yes. I mean, to the extent that that experience has carried through in the the individuals who are working on this plan, um, uh, we absolutely have. I think Washington County has has used that, for instance, in looking at road closures and, and looking at, at what bridges uh, might be vulnerable. Uh, so, yeah. We also look at it in day-to-day -day operations when we consider the placement of existing infrastructure. So one of the prime examples is uh, our siting studies associated with the placement of our pump station. Mm -hmm. yeah. Guys, don't wash your cars down the creek. Well, and and also to know which which roads um, mm -hmm. might become closed de facto with flooding, so that we can look at that with respect to um, uh, how our how we operate our water resource recovery facilities, for instance, or how we get access to a pump station. So, yeah, so um, I, I like the visual feedback. It's just like a one, one, uh, one kind of get up from by the way. Simple. Um, so, on this Kagan's safety of dams project, 
is all the funding for anything to do with that needs to come from FEMA or the federal government? I can answer that. So this uh, uh, Scoggins Dam is a Bureau of Reclamation federal agency. And under the Bureau of Reclamation Safety of Dams program, it's an 85% federal share and a 15% local share. That local share is shared by the uh, beneficiaries, the original investors in that project, which includes Allen's Group, 12 Valley Irrigation District, Clean Water Services, the City of Beaverton, Forest Grove, so those are the five entities that have to share that 15 percent. I think what Ann was, we are trying to project that we are planning because we have to plan for that 15 percent. The, the, the cost estimate in 2019 dollars was 780 million dollars. I suspect it's probably more expensive now than it was then. Um, so making sure that we're planning for that locally, but also advocating for it. So where I was going with that lead in this. I think the plan that we, I think we had also saw a few meetings back in the legislative agenda about the attacking guns. That looks to be more like funding and the budgeting for preventive or the update of the dam. For which something happens tomorrow and then the fix needed. Do we still need to wait for FEMA federal funds or do we have another budgeting process to fix attacking the dam? In December, funding process. I think the president's budget came up today or maybe tomorrow. So each year we see that, and it's usually funding and kind of close to the Bureau of Reclamation. Is it $780 million? No, because they're still in the design process. They are, I forget what percentage they are. It's and now they'll have to go through the process, which they're expecting they'll get done in the next two. So it's, it is a little like, oh, it's the most threatened dam, it's going to fall down. And this are on a real hurry up schedule, which means, I don't know, seven or eight more years, perhaps. We've been going at it since 2012. So it's a separate budget. Anything yes. Needs yeah. to fix into that, of that is a separate federal agency, and it's a separate budget. The, the interesting thing, unlike a lot of FEMA stuff, is it's it's a programmatic piece. It's not a it's not a and Shannon has handed me the, the magic piece of paper. We did want to just mention a little bit um, of the, the feedback that we got from CWAC, um, and we uh, also got a, a letter, thank you very much, from the Tualatin River Keepers. Um, so those are the comments on, on our annex. And I'll just hit maybe the, the top themes. Um, the first of which is, is water quality. And some of it was related to how resilient can we make the, the repairing plantings that, that Rich just spent time uh, discussing with you. Uh, some of it was more around other water quality issues and, and other than making sure that we keep um, uh, sanitary sewage where it needs to be in the pipe and not in, in the river. Um, we don't really have a water quality component. FEMA doesn't fund water quality projects per se. Um, they, they are trying to figure out what it means to fund a climate resilience project. Um, that has been something that is new in the last couple of years. So uh, there may be some of these um, uh, projects that have a substantial water quality component uh, that for which we could get FEMA funding. Um, but we aren't seeing that uh, uh, right now. So that stream channel dynamics, we know that, that we live in a, a dynamic landscape. Streams are not supposed to be locked in place. If they are, they look like the LA River. Um, with concrete bottoms, concrete sides, and, and uh, not much in the way of of anything that a fish would want to, to be in. Um, I, we're specifically focused, as I said, on our facilities, our provision of services when it comes to looking at that. So one of the things that we have long had that, that to some degree, to a large degree, does reduce the vulnerability of our sanitary collection system, particularly the small lines, 
is that we have a, a have done a risk analysis for our sanitary lines um, as they relate to risk from stream channel erosion. Um, and so we know where those are. We um, are repairing them as we can. And one of the action items is to, to get not just the ones that are exposed dealt with, but to get the ones that are close to being exposed. Uh, uh, water rights as a drought mitigation strategy was was brought up. This has been something that I think Clean Water Services has been talking about for a very long time. We do have some water rights. They aren't um, uh, necessarily always reserved for in-stream use. We're talking about a, a, a water bank, but we're talking about it in the climate, our climate adaptation roadmap, which is um, uh, going to the board in, in the board learning session then on April 6th. So um, some things we, we felt were better really captured in that climate adaptation strategy document rather than in the, the natural hazard mitigation plan. Um, and then some things we put in both because we want different audiences to see um, see that those issues being addressed. Stormwater management and flooding. Um, I, uh, Diane's mantra to me for the last hmm, how many years, many years, um, has been we're not a flood control agency and we are not a flood control agency. We have through our the stormwater part of our permit some responsibilities to manage um, runoff volumes uh, and there are some things for which we may find um, flood management benefits ancillary to to a broader stormwater um, project, but uh, that was one of the themes. Um, earth, with regard to earthquakes, uh, primarily looking at, at shaking, straight shaking and liquefaction, and there was a question about the difference between a Cascadia zone earthquake and a local crustal earthquake. Cascadia zone, really big, but still out of the coast, you know, 90 plus miles uh, away from us. Versus some of these crustal earthquakes, if there was one, for instance, on the Gales Creek Fault, which is the fault that goes underneath Scoggins Dam, the localized shaking is predicted to be stronger than we would get even with a, a crustal zone, large crustal zone earthquake. So we always are playing off this magnitude, frequency, um, geography type of, of evaluation. Liquefaction is when um, uh, Saturated soils basically separate into uh, more water and more soil and the land surface drops. And you can imagine if you've got um, a collection system in that area that it, it could cause the pipes to rupture. We are trying to develop what we call a safe fail strategy. We, because liquefiable soils are pervasive um, except in the, the, the mountain sides um, across the Tualatin Basin. We can't avoid them with our, our collection system. So instead, we'd rather see if we can figure out places where it would be more prudent or more prudent for a failure to occur because it would be easier to manage a failure. So we're trying to work with that on, on our, um, a couple of our master plans that are in process. And then the last bit, um, uh, the last thing was energy and power supply. So making sure that we have um, power supply redundancies, um, just as I have had Stephanie uh, save my bacon throughout this presentation, <laughs> we wanna have those sorts of redundancies. So in addition to um, increasing use of, of renewables, how do we strategically manage fuel supply um, generators, things like that. Um, so we will be considering CWAG's comments as we um, develop the next plan to go in front of the next version to go in front of the board. And um, we look forward to getting this approved by FEMA and, and uh, adopting and implementing um, the action items that we've laid out. And I would like to thank everyone for taking the time to review this and comment on it. We appreciate 
your contributions and your time. Thank you. Thanks again. That's good. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll have Mark Jockers see what housekeeping. So housekeeping, right? That is what we call it. So we have had a tremendous influx of leaders. You're uh, you've got a senior status here. Now. Oh, you've been for what three years now? Mm -hmm. And Stu, Stu's just got a boy who's second term. Mike. Mike has got his second term. So there are a few people that have been here. Or actually, actually, Mike, it might be Mike's 25th term. I was going to say. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and for the example, I had black hair. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, to, to give in full disclosure, Mike was the city rep when he worked for the city of uh, Tuolo. For a long time, he was the person who said here as a city rep. And, uh, not long after he retired, Commissioner Rogers appointed him to the commission. So you you have a very long tenure. But toward that um, toward that issue, we are looking for opportunities to provide orientation, commission to provide the bigger picture of our funding, utilities we operate, where we operate. But where and we have been hosting these Saturday sessions with local elected officials and with um, staff members. And we are we have a Saturday session on April 22nd, remarkably early day, four hours from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on a Saturday at our Durham facility in time. You'll get an invitation for that. Uh, if you're able to attend, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. Not, we will find another time to cover these things. You, uh, the commission most likely will be joined by other elected officials that Joe will invite, as well as, for instance, the new public works director. Be sure he's there. Sherilyn, if you've got new staff members that would benefit from this, we would certainly welcome. The other thing that um, Stephanie and I have been working on is you will get a short survey. We're trying to look at how we should operate this most effectively. We're going to ask you a number of questions on. You still want us to mail things to you, or would you prefer that you get it electronically, or would you prefer just to pick it up here? Um, do you want us to send electronic calendar invitations? So that's Stephanie. Make sure that I'm here. We've got so send so we can do that. You'll get all those questions. There'll also be questions like. Do you have any dietary preferences which we should be aware of? Because we always want to feed you. I want to make sure we're feeding you the right things. Any requests for accommodations you may have. Um, also, we're collecting a variety of demographic information on the commission, uh, race, age, gender, pieces like that that we need to collect that will need to be sent to a report to our, to our board as well. So that will come to you by noon tomorrow, is that what we said? We'll set it up tomorrow. Uh, we'll set it up tomorrow. Day. I think it'll take you five minutes. So that's all I have for housekeeping. Thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, we have the public comment session. Are still with us? I do see that she is online with us. Yes. Okay, uh, we invite public comments. There's a two minute limit with Stephanie will time. Yes, I have no comment. I'm interested in the mission. I worked for 10 years for the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Conservation Programs, and I like to see what's what's going on in our area. So, but I have no specific comment at the moment. Okay, well, great. Thank you for joining us. With that, Mark, we'll move on to announcements. Okay, so survey comes tomorrow. Uh, we've got that uh, orientation at Clean Water Services Evangelist on the 22nd. For those of you that are serving on the budget committee, that meeting is on the 5th, and I'm going to quickly look here. Your budget will be delivered to you on okay. a week before, <laughs> two weeks before. Oh, is it two? Yes, the 28th, okay. uh, the 28th of uh, April, you'll get the budget, which will be two weeks in advance. If you're new to the budget committee, uh, Kathy, our CFO, is available to sit down kind of go over the whole piece with you so you can understand that. At our next meeting in April, Kathy will be here talking broadly about what our budget looks like. We'll also talk to you about something that we need to do something called a cost of service study. 
also looks at how we allocate our costs. And finally, I've told you this before, we are hosting a joint barbecue and canoe trip on the 12 River on Thursday, the 14th of September. And that way, it's a lens group, the 12 River Keepers down at the park. So we'll get you all those things. And our next meeting is on the 12th of May. That's all I have, Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, I hope you'll come back. Next month. <laughs> I think I think we will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with that, we'll adjourn. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, just a quick update. Yes, this is that. Next two meetings I might be calling into more. I'll be there here. Twelve. That's when I arrive in India. Yeah, just to let you know. Thank you. Uh, other than that, I just wanted to give an endorsement for the Apple program. The most informative yeah. yes, session. I, I've already started. I'm graduating. You're right. You're right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.